everybody on this episode of the gym master show live entertainment lifestyle celebrity talk show series we are celebrating classic television yes some of your favorite shows and series like i love lucy the lucy show we are going to talk about the incomparable Betty White and even sprinkle in some Judy Garland for you. We've got an extraordinary guest that's joining us here, celebrated Thomas J. Watson. Yes, as we celebrate together, Lucio Ball, and we're going to sprinkle in some Betty White and some Judy Garland for you as well. Welcome, everybody, to the show. I'm Jim Masters. This is our Entertainment Lifestyle Celebrity Talk Show series. If you'd like to engage with us, you can certainly do that. You can chat in the Jameis Lovety Hall chat room when you subscribe to the channel and interact with us and have a good time. We're going to dive right in. We have so much to talk about. You guys know I work in TV and radio, so I love talking about classic television. Our special guest, Tom Watson, has devoted much of his career to the study of classic television with an emphasis on the programs of Lucio Ball. Most recently, Recently, 2013 through 2020, he served as an executive producer on CBS television series, I Love Lucy, the colorized primetime specials. Yes, the ones you've seen colorized airing on CBS. He produced the recent DVD releases of the Lucy show seasons one through six and the Blu-ray uh, Blu releases of I Love Lucy. Lots of L's in that. <laughs> seasons one and two. He also uh, headed uh, the Los Angeles-based team that produced the annual Loving Lucy fan conventions from 1996 through 2001. He co-authored or authored as well, Loving Lucy, an illustrated tribute to Lucio Ball with Bart Andrews. Classic moments from I Love Lucy, the quotable I Love Lucy, and Color Me Lucy as well. And he served as assistant to the producers of Lucio Ball's final TV series, Life with Lucy, back in 1986, and as a director of publicity and business affairs for Lucio Ball Productions, 1986 through 1990. Uh, Tom also co-authored Betty White's Pet Love with Ms. White in 1983 and Judy Portrait of an American Legend with Bill Chapman, which is amazing. Tom also started his career in the research department at the CBS television network in New York from 70 to 77 and Los Angeles, 77 to 83, and later served as vice president, research director of initiative media, media from 1991 to 2002. And he is our very special guest here on the show, and we're excited to welcome him. Let's welcome Tom Watson to the Gym Masters show. <laughs> How are you, Mr. Watson? Great to be here. Great to be here. It is a pleasure to be here as well. How did you like our show open and the intro? I yeah, I love that. And the genie bottle and all the whole thing. Wonderful. You notice the genie bottle here too. We have it on set and this was a gift. I had wanted the genie bottle for so many years, I dream of genie. And uh, the person that gave it to me had been searching and searching and searching and she found the hand painted one, the real heavy duty one, uh, it was a little pricey, but it's it's worth it and really, really a charm. And you know some folks you were mentioning off air that also have some right. versions of the bottle as well, right? Right, definitely. So it's a very popular uh, thing to have if it, when, for, for the fans of the show, yeah. Yes, yeah, I've always been a fan of the show as well. And of course, what can you say about uh, Lucio Ball and I Love Lucy and the Lucy show? Uh, Lucy Arnaz has a wonderful friend. She's been a guest several times on our show. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And several other folks related to the shows as well. And, and Michael Stern is a friend. And like you and I were saying, everything is just one degree of, uh, of separation. Oh. Jess Oppenheimer was just on the show, of course, uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And it was right. really... Yeah. Did you see that episode? Yes. Yeah. Wasn't that wonderful? Wow. His, uh, you know, it's, it's really fantastic to have an opportunity to talk about these kinds of things. And uh, so when did the love for Lucy begin for you? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that was his Scooby-Doo yeah. impression. <laughs> yeah. I'm a little bit older than you are. Damn it. I'm a little bit older than most people are. Well, was, you never was, know with lighting. <laughs> I, I was born in the late 1940s. Okay, maybe a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> my, 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 when I was first starting out, my 
gag line was my parents had television before they had me. Well, today everybody's does, but back then that wasn't true because television really didn't take off in this country until the early 50s. Yes. And my dad sold television sets. He, he sold all kinds of electronics. And so we had one in our living room when nobody else did. And we had an aerial on our roof and neighbors would walk by and walk, you know, the market. And you grew up where? In Indiana, a little small Indiana. town in Indiana. Wow. And so I grew up with this thing. In, yes. I was part of the first television generation that yes. got, had TV as a babysitter. Yes. And my, I had two, two brothers and a sister, and they all were normal people who watched TV and went about their business. I watched TV and fell in love with it. Yes. And somehow I knew almost from the very beginning, I want to be part of that. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Maybe I'd be a, a salesman like my dad and sell TVs. It doesn't matter. I need, this is going to be part of my life. And so I guess I knew that from like age three on that this I need is going to be part of me. And I later went to uh, Ball State University. David Letterman was in most of my classes. Uh, That's right. We were, yeah. Wow. We were in Indiana together. And anyway, uh, I always appreciated the Lucy shows. And I saw from, from the beginning the, the primetime shows when it was on every Monday night. Because it was Indiana, it was on at 8 o'clock, not 9 o'clock. And so even though I was four, five, six years old, my parents let me stay up and see it. But then nine th or 8.30 was bedtime. But anyway, so I saw all the shows from the beginning and somehow it was it was always my favorite show you know and it just it, she's always been part of my life and as my walls <laughs> illustrate she still is and uh anyway you I, you asked me how when i when did it when did it all start for me well it started basically at birth mm. so that's it <laughs> So was I Love Lucy always on in the house with the parents watching it all too? Yeah, uh, yes. One of the, the one of the nice things for me was the fact. Of, well, first of all, there were five others in our house, four, and then my sister was added, but um, she's younger than I am. But uh, funny thing is, television, like I said, had just begun and. There wasn't always a lot on, and it wasn't on, you know, 24-7 like it is today. But anyway, my mother had her favorite shows, which tended to be murder mysteries and things like Boston Blackie and those kinds of things. My father was into comedy, but he was into uh, variety comedy. He loved the Jackie Gleason show, the Milton Berle shows, uh, you know, the... Sid Caesar, that sort of comedy. And my older brothers liked the action adventure things or things like Death Valley Days and Ramar of the Jungle and shows of that ilk. But somehow everybody got together and watched Lucy together on Monday night. It was the one thing that everybody in the family, it was appointment TV before we had that expression, you know. And uh, I wish I could tell you that I remember seeing little Ricky being born, but I can't remember that. I've seen that episode 40,000 times since, but I cannot tell you I did. I would have been four and a half years old that night. I do remember the next day though, because the next day Dwight Eisenhower took office. And this was the January 20th, I guess, of 1953. And it was the first time it was coast to coast live coverage of a president being sworn in and my older brother was in the fifth grade i believe and my mother invited because we had one of the few tvs in the neighborhood my mother invited half of his fifth grade class and some other family got the other half so they could all see the president of the united states take office and i remember that because there was a big party in our living room and they were all watching tv so like yeah. i said 
television became an important element of my being right from the very beginning. And mm. so, anyway. you have a favorite episode of I Love Lucy? Is there an episode that is you, one or two maybe that are your personal favorites? No, I like them all. You like them Nothing all. I yeah. don't like. Did you like it better when they were in the downstairs apartment or when they moved upstairs to the fancier apartment and they had the window over the piano? Well, it was fancier. It was certainly fancier. And, and then they moved to Connecticut, to Westport. The big, wide, the big, wide Connecticut home. And Lucille Ball loved that because it gave them play space when you're on the stage. You know, the, the original yeah. apartment was so tiny that, you know... It, it was only like five or three, five or ten steps, and you were in the next room over. So they felt cramped from the very beginning. But you know, TV was just starting out, and when they started this show, no one thought it was going to last. So no, no uh, there was no money spent. Those first thirteen episodes are a little on the—I don't want to say crude side, but basic side, I guess. Most of the things they were wearing the arnazes brought from home it's not a big uh budget there was not a big element in the budget for day-to-day -day costumes so like what i've got on what you've got on we wore our own clothes on this show folks <laughs> there is no gym master's wardroom department fine that was true on <laughs> thirteen episodes of i love lucy too because absolutely no one other than the arnazes gave that show credibility. Everybody said, yeah, well, let her do it. And, you know, so all I'm saying is that it was very, those things are, were very, very basic, you know, but so the apartment, they didn't have a lot of money. And plus one of the reasons Desi Lou became a production company was none of the motion picture studios wanted it. That was the enemy. For years and years and years, radio and movies had been married. They made it, you'd make a big movie, and of all the radio people wanted you on their show, and the studios encouraged it because it was um, publicity. You know, they'd say, you know, our guest tonight is Jim Masters, who is starring in that brand new movie, blah, 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 blah. And then you'd be on there and talking about whatever they were talking about, and they were also promoting your movie. Well, TV was not that. Plus, yeah. TV meant those people were st keeping, staying in home at night watching the shows. They weren't out buying tickets to the theater. So none of the studios wanted I Love Lucy or any other TV show to be done out here. So n nine tenths of those early TV series were done out of New York. And so no one rented them, you know, they, they, they were lucky to find the space they found. You yeah. know, it was, a, it was a small little studio, General Service is what it was called then, General Service Studios. And they were just damn lucky they got that. So once the show went on the air, became a hit, then suddenly money opens up. Hello, we love Yes. See, let's, here's, here's, let, so by the time that there was a real reason in the script for them to want to move because they now had the baby and so they worked that in as the excuse but they wanted them the actors need wanted more space because there's only so much you can do when you're in this one little box <laughs> that's so true right <laughs> it's uh did did you ever get a chance to see a taping i know our mutual friend michael stern got a chance to it wasn't i love lucy of course but it was one of the leaders i think it was here's lucy right i i i well i worked on the 13 life with lucy's we did in the 1980s so yeah i saw all i saw her work on that but not the earlier series because from 1970 to 77 i was working at cbs in new york and so by the time i moved out here uh in 77 she was had retired from weekly tv and was doing specials why do you think this series didn't take was it timed wrong was it just you know i i've seen i saw it then and i've subsequently analyzed it and watched it again and i know 
it really, she took this hard when this series didn't take. Um, what, you know, she'd always been on television all these years, and then she was always beloved and, and remains. But what was it about this series that you think were some of the elements where it just didn't continue or take? Oh, uh, that's hard to say. Part of it, a great deal of it had to do with well, two, two things, really. One was they wanted it to, they wanted to maintain the innocence, if you will, of the earlier Lucy shows. And it was on the air at a time when the audience had gotten much more sophisticated. Uh, we were on Saturday night at 8, and at 9 o'clock, of course, was the Golden Girls. And they were talking about... Uh, sex and who you slept with last night and you know blanche was sleeping with everybody in miami and other some of the others were trying to get dates and things like that that kind of thing would not have you know was not really material for the lucy show if you will and so that was an el a key element a very key element the fact that it was sort of a, a a step out of time, if you will. It, it, it tried to retain its the, the Lucy heritage, if you will, the innocence of, of that period when the audience was used to, at this point, a little bit more. And it's or not... K stuff and updated. It's not, that, it's not that they couldn't have done the other, but at the same time, I'm not quite sure, you know, if they had done shows dealing with sexuality and things of that nature like the golden girls there was always the element well would the audience buy her delivering some of those lines i mm -hmm. i can't answer that the other element which was the real big problem and that is timing and i don't yeah. mean her timing i mean the show's timing insofar as if we're if you and I put our heads together this evening and decide we're going to do a TV show, uh, we would probably work on it for a few months and come up with the premise and put it on paper so that we can pass it around. And then we'd pitch it to a studio or a network and say, this is what Tom and Jim are going to do and suggest storylines and that sort of thing and get people behind it. And then, if we're lucky, if somebody says, yes, it sounds great, guys. Here's some money. Make a pilot. You make a pilot. You find out what ideas worked, what ideas didn't work. And if you're lucky, somebody will say, yeah, the pilot wasn't exactly what we wanted, but we still love the idea, so let's go to series. It might go on the air next fall. It might go on the air next winter. She agreed to come back to TV March 1st or 2nd in the spring of 86 and it went on the air in september no pilot no concept there was not an idea the idea was lucy O'Ball will come back to tv in a half hour sitcom that is much like her earlier show period and aaron spelling was involved right that's right yeah uh i don't have the exact details but the stories that i heard i worked on the show the stories i heard was ABC nowadays is owned by Disney. Prior to, and in the 50s, it was owned by a, a corporation that spun off of Paramount Pictures when they split the theater chain. So ABC Paramount Theaters was the And at one time it was Capital City Communications, Communications right? Studies. Yes. Capital City Communications. The period I were, this were involved with. They tended to be... very very arch conservative and when they bought abc they were embarrassed for no good reason but i mean i'm see I, I don't want to say this negatively i just happen to be a flaming liberal and so it's hard for me to understand but anyway they were embarrassed by the fact that aaron spelling had five or six hour-long adventure shows on that were in those days called tits and ass television in so far charlie's angels and things like that that were in fact part of the things that uh 
sophisticated, if that's the word you want to use, brought, you know, sex and innuendo into the television arena, not in comedies, but with the hour-long adventure shows. His contract guaranteed him a new show every year for the run of the contract. Yeah. Well, they, he went in with a couple of ideas for the fall of 86, and the new people who had now taken over and they inherited the contract, they were saying, we are not going to put any more hits and ass TV on our stations, and we would like to, and as soon as yours start fading, we'd like to get rid of them. In other words, they wanted that genre out of there. Gone. I get it. So they said, look, we'll honor the contract, but you need to come up with a show that we can live with. And so anyway, his very first job in Hollywood when he was an out-of-work actor back in 1955, 50, 55, 54, he played a gas station attendant that filled up the Ricardo's uh, Pontiac on their trip to California. To California. He was just a backwoods gas station attendant. He has about two minutes, three minutes on this on camera. I forgot about that. Yeah. Because anyway, there was there was always an affinity there, and they were friends and all this sort of stuff. And like I say, he was one of the biggest, most successful producers in town in 1986. Yes. And he said, yeah. "I don't if in order to keep my contract valid." He had to deliver a show. So he asked her, You want to go back into television? I've got a show. I've got it. I've got a guaranteed show, a place on the schedule, but I don't have a show. If you'll do your show, we'll marry your show with my guaranteed time period and we'll be off. And we'll she was off, yeah. about it. She'd yeah. been sitting home for 12 years, basically playing backgammon and doing one or two specials a year. And Desi, Desi had already passed that year, too. No, oh, not was, yet. This was 86. like January, February, and he mm. died in December. Mm. So um, anyway, I'm just saying she was interested. Somebody saying, you know, you don't have to do a pilot. You don't have to do any of that stuff. Just show up and we'll do it. And unfortunately, you can't put together a show on the fly like that. You just can't. They brought in Gail Gordon, brought him back. Well, he, she... she well, the thing is, now there's another element, I, timing. This yeah. was March. Every, most of the shows that were being announced for that fall, for that were brand new, had been in development for a year, year and a half, like I mentioned. The other element is the new shows and the returning shows basically had sucked up all the town. And I don't want to say it that way. Had sucked up all the viable working the writers the directors the producers they all had jobs it was very few so what did she do what you most people do you call in the people you've worked with in the past and so she called bob and madeline bob carroll jr madeline davis they had sort of they were sort of in semi-retirement the writers of i love lucy and all the way back uh would you be interested oh dear you know and when do they want this thing you know what in september this is march you know that sort of thing and so you know there we are um with lucy arnez yeah tell the viewers who we're seeing here yeah yes madeline davis lucy arnez yours truly and bob carroll jr and that was at one of our Lucille Ball conventions here, like in the 1999, I believe, something like that. And Madeline but, and Barb Carroll Jr. wrote, you know, I Love Lucy. And uh, along with, uh, I think earlier I said we had Jess Oppenheimer on the show. We had Greg on the show. It, it would be difficult to have Jess. <laughs> he was unavailable. Greg, his son, was with us. Yeah. Right, right. So anyway, uh, because so many of the people or you might say, well, why, why about getting such and so? Well, he's busy. What about such and so? Well, he's busy. You know, they all had, they all had jobs lined up for the fall. And so she, she does, most people would, uh, called up her old friends. And um, Gail had been working in Canada. 
uh, doing dinner theaters and all sorts of live theater things up there. And, you know, would you come back? Because fe she felt like at least if he, she had him, she could build a show around somehow around the two of them. And that's that's the way it all got started. But they did not have a concept. They didn't have anything. All they had was Lucille Balls coming back to TV. Mm -hmm. And that was not enough when you're six months out. We went into production day after July the 4th, like July the 5th, you idiot. So uh, there you are. So, you know, we had three months to pull a show together and we had a good cast and Bob and Madeline called up all their friends and we got scripts. But sometimes those scripts were coming out of Mimeo and we were shooting them the next day, you know. <laughs> There's no time. We had no time to go through things and say, ooh, do we think we ought to do that? Maybe we ought to change that to this, to that, to that. But anyway, so that's why I say the timing, the, the two elements of time were against us. One was the style of the show was very 1964, not 1986. And the, uh, the timing, of, we didn't have any chance to change anything. Now, you started your career in the research department at CBS in the Tiffany Network in 19, in the 70s, from 70 to 77 yeah. in New York. And um, it was a Catherine Hepburn, Spencer Tracy movie. Uh, they usually run it at Christmas time called Desk Set. That's the department I was in. So and, did you come across some of the incredible iconic folks that were in the building, uh, the Walter Cronkites, others uh, well, along the way? Uh, some, yes. I, but by that time, they had split, and I was in what they call Black Rock on 51 West 52nd Street. Mr. Cronkite and some of the others were at the Broadcast Center over on 10th Avenue and 57th Street. And occasionally, I had reason to be in his building. Uh, and yeah, I, I would... I, when I had a chance, I would, they would put chairs in and we could watch him deliver, you know, the evening news. That's when news were new, was news, I swear. Yeah. You know, uh, what we have today, I, I guess, is a place for, but, you know, they, even the ones that I really love will open up with a, uh, you know, a piece of news that lasts about 15 seconds and then it's, let's discuss. And then they spend 15 minutes discussing 15 yes. seconds worth of news. Oh, my God. You sound like me. Yeah. the All the opinion and all the conversation. Yes. They'll give you a headline. And here to discuss is, I'm like, no, no, no. I want to know the story. Take me to where it is. Exactly. I don't want to have a round table of 15 people tell me their opinions on what I should be doing and what should be happening. What this might mean. I don't care what it might mean. <laughs> this moves on to the next story. Right. You know? Yeah, uh, we kindred, kindred I'm, spirits on that, Tom. Absolutely. I'm old fashioned. What can I say? No, <laughs> you're you're uh, you've got an old soul, but uh, a, a big heart in that regard. So, so yes, I was at CBS for seven you, years. I'd be there. I, I, I would. I, I had no plans whatsoever to ever leave New York. I when yeah. When I left Indiana. I went to New York on a Greyhound bus with a suitcase and a brown paper uh, cardboard box. And I got off at, uh, you know, the bus station and I felt, I felt in my heart like Mary Richards, you know, throwing her hat in the air, feeling like I'm here. You're I, yeah, I, the I, big I, apple, the big time, I, CBS, yeah. They invited me to leave insofar as they were gonna move my job. And uh, gee, you know, if my desk isn't gonna be there anymore, they are moving it to out here because they were moving about six or 16 of us out here. To Los Angeles, yeah. To Los yeah. Angeles. And because at that point, the only thing that was out in LA was a uh, production company. I mean, production facilities. Right. From Television City in Hollywood. It's, oh, yes. It was, a, it was a production studio. Fabulous. Yeah. And New York was where all the execs and the, the businesses, the sales, the right, all of it. And they decided they wanted to mix it more. And so they took a bunch of us out here. And so I decided, so I, well, okay, I'll try it for a year. 
that was 40 years ago. Yes. What was it like working in iconic television city, which I know isn't quite what it was yeah, now. Now they've sold the building and they've moved most of the stuff out. I've got a, I've got a feeling that Mr. Paley must be spinning in his grave because their whole thing was to have everything consolidated in one nice big building so that you can walk down the corridor to a totally different office and everybody's pulling, you know, for the same team. And in radio, radio grew so fast that they had little things all over New York and their main place was 485 Madison Avenue, but it was a small New York office building. So in the early 60s, they said, we're going to build our own. And they put up this big skyscraper called Black Rock. And mm -hmm. so they combined all of the offices in that nice big building so everybody could now go back to disseminating everything. Everything's all over. Because somebody decided our real estate is more valuable. So in other words, I can rent you some office space across the street in that dump, and then I can get <laughs> a fine, beautiful office and get big bucks for it. And that's what they've done. Yeah, yeah. An iconic uh, facility where so many of our favorite shows were done. Uh, and of course, they just moved the prices right to Glendale and the Bob Barker studio. And uh, we had, we did a tribute to Bob Barker. We had Wink Martindale and Bob's agent, Roger Neal and many others on the show and Randy West and uh, so many others. And uh, yeah, it just, when you would hear from television city in Hollywood, it meant something really, really special. Yeah. And, uh, and that was an, I, that building was something, a lot Our of offices was in Judy Garland's dressing room, what had been built as Judy Garland's dressing room because they had no office space for us. We got out of here before they were ready for us. So they put the research department in a bungalow that was built up on the roof. There was one over here that was Judy's and there was one on the other side of the roof that had been Danny Kay's because they both had big variety shows starting in the fall of 63. And they had no facilities, so they added these beautiful bungalows well after the the stars had left they took all the off they reconfigured it and put in false walls and made six offices out of the the, the bungalow so that's where we wound up at least the first couple of years we were out here we were in judy garland's dressing room how <laughs> how special is that and you you wrote a book too uh tell us about this uh, this is really fantastic, co-authoring this with uh, Bill Chapman, well, Bill Judy, was, Portrait of an American Legend. Yeah, you know, Bill was a lifelong collector, and he had thousands of photographs, and uh, he knew everybody in town who were, loose, were Judy fans. I had been a Judy fan from the very beginning because when I was watching my TV, the all the old MGM movies became staples on television. So her and Mickey Rooney and all those old MGM stars became part of my childhood, just as they had an earlier generation seeing them in the theaters. So anyway, I was very much a Judy fan, but not as card carrying as maybe Bill was. Uh, and he had this stack of photographs. And I said, well, we ought to do something. Why don't you select some photographs, I'll do the connective material, and we'll do a book. We pitched that idea, and a, a lovely gentleman named Tom Miller, who was then at McGraw-Hill, he's still in the business. He's an ed I, I, uh, agent now, I believe, editor, agent. Anyway, he was our agent, or a editor at McGraw-Hill, and they wanted more than uh, just... Uh, bits and pieces of information, they wanted a real book book. And so we wrote, I wrote this, I wrote the book, Bill provided all the photographs and the embarrassing thing was when we got the whole thing done, they decided they wanted half of it. In other words, they, they wanted it trimmed down because we wrote what was, we put in there exactly what the story was. And then they said, well, we'll take 50%. <laughs> So we had to go through and basically take out 50%. But we we it, we took out the quotes and the 
the backstories and all that sort of stuff and left the basics. So it became, it was very successful. It's just that uh, that style of book, I think, is fallen by the wayside, but still it, it was very successful. And we sent it to the family. I got a nice letter back from Liza's office and, you know, people appreciated the book. It's just that, you know, yeah. While I was doing, I was doing that at the same time I was finishing up at CBS. And so to get to the question you haven't asked yet, my agent at the time, a gentleman named Bart Andrews, he had, he was watching television one afternoon and Betty White was on one of the talk shows, a talk show much like this where people were just chatting. And she was there with a couple of pets. And she was, uh, the, the gist of the interview was that uh, how good pets take care of people. Yes. Her husband, Alan Ludden, had died just a few months earlier. And she was explaining how uh, having a pet can even get you through the grief process because yeah. they get you out of bed in the morning and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, bells rang in Bart's head and he called her agent and he said, I've got a writer who's looking for a project. Would Betty be interested in doing what she just did on the TV show, but in book form? Mm. She loved the idea. And so Betty and I got together and we worked on a book for almost a year. It's called Pet Love. And, uh, Liam Morrow, I think, was the publisher. Anyway, it was fun to do. She enjoyed it, and uh, it kept her focused at a time when she really needed to be. And shortly after that, she had just finished doing Mama's Family. Oh, yes. Shortly after that, that she fell into The Golden Girls. So it was yes. a nice bridge for her. And it was wonderful for me to sit in her house every live every in her living room and help her write the book because she didn't believe she had been a, a high school English student and she loved writing and she loved but she thought she she had never done anything more than small articles you know some or some short piece of information that was backstage at, at mama's family she's dressed up as ellen there that's mm. what looks as strange as she does and i don't know what happened to the guy standing next to her right now he's on the <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is a great shot too is this in her backyard this is the backyard yeah 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 and of course she passed away a couple of years ago and you know that whole place was bought i was sold a few weeks later and all that's gone it's just really yeah, this town does not have any appreciation for history. So that was backstage, I believe, at Password, Super Password. Oh, boy. I was playing with Lucy. Well, you know, you're talking about no regard for history and some of the past. They just tore down that Warner Columbia Ranch with all of those houses and facades. And I've been chatting with a couple of folks in the industry as well and, and saying it Boy, I wish there was a way they could have lifted some of those and made a museum out of it or did tours, even if it wasn't necessarily there, but they just did something to preserve some of it. So it was right. show people, too, in the industry, this is how it used to be done. This is the way it was for the historical purposes of so many iconic shows and movies that right. were filmed on those streets. And it's all gone. I saw a drone video of them demolishing the bewitched house, which was also Dr. Bellows house. And just, uh, it was sad to see. It was like your childhood was being ripped away by cranes. How do you feel about it? Well, I no, I agree with you hundred percent. I've heard that what they want to do is put in sound stages there. It's, I mean, it will still be production space. And their claim was that shows don't use those kind of false front type of sets anymore and if they do they're brand new ones they're not those classic ones but uh, i mean i see their point but at the same time i agree with what you said it's too bad we couldn't have moved them someplace you know uh 
I, it's, it's incredibly sad. I've noticed in this town more than most, there is absolutely no love of this kind of thing. You know, as long the as- The historical it, nature of things. Yeah, things get, when I moved out here in 1977, the brand new place in town was ABC Entertainment Center over, over at uh, Century City. It's gone. Mm. They tore that. The, there was a Schubert theater in there and a couple of movie theaters and all this kind of stuff. I swear I saw Dream Girls, things like that. Again, we're talking 1977. Gone. Gone. It, yeah. It, it's, well, it's so, somebody told me, well, it's so old. Old? It's 40 years old. I mean, I was. I was That's used, not old. <laughs> where, where I grew up in Indiana, we had buildings downtown that had been built. A century earlier and when i got to new york and i'd walk down fifth avenue oh, the yeah. same thing now yeah. weren't necessarily the same businesses in other words right. the double day bookstore may have been in something that was once a priceless jewelry store i'm not saying that yeah. the building is still there and it's probably still there today mm. nowadays out here bang if it's not something brand new it's they gone want. Well, you go up to Boston and parts of New England, that thing's from the 1700s and you know, 1800s and the East Coast, Philly, and de definite uh, history. And uh, yeah, the, the Midwest, I think, and the East Coast are more like each other than the Midwest and the West Coast. Right. It's just this sort of preservation of history and it's just sort of the way of uh, maybe the East Coast is a little bit faster and ramped up a little bit but i just think that you know if somebody goes from the east coast to the mid and mid to the east there's some sort of a similarity a little bit uh and maybe not as much shock value as when you're going to parts of the of the west coast for you indiana boy going west was there uh adaptability did you have to uh, adapt to some of it all well no not for some reason no it it uh it was sort of, for me, Los Angeles was a blend of my Indiana experience and my New York experience. It sort of took the simplicity and the space of Indiana and married it to the some of the sophistication of New York. And so I still had my CBS job, but I had an apartment instead of a shoebox. I mean, right. you know, <laughs> when I was living in New York, I'm sorry, my apartment was sold. Very uh, expensive. No, 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 was, small, my yeah. apartment was so small, I had to go out in the hall to change my mind because yeah. it was like, you yeah. know. That's why a lot of people commute from the suburbs, uh, New Jersey, uh, Westchester, yeah. Long Island, Connecticut. Well, most of the people I worked with at CBS all live someplace else. Sub suburbs, I, yeah. That's not me. You wanted to be right in the heart of it all. Yeah. yeah and I loved it. I, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. Uh, Do you get back east at all? Not enough. It's not beautiful enough. at Christmas time, isn't it? Oh. Yeah. I just love to walk down Fifth Avenue. It's coming, it's yeah. The tree. Yeah. They're coming into that season now. Yeah. Yeah. You also, I mean, you have been really, as a classic TV historian and author, working in the television industry as well as I do. So we're kindred spirits in that. You, like I said, from early on, you've had this wonderful regard, respect, and profound interest in, in everything Lucy. And you've even had an opportunity to do things like loving Lucy. Tell us about these kinds of things. This is really something very, very yeah. special. We had a fan club that I basically fan conventions, yeah. Yeah, we had a fan club that I basically spearheaded, uh, even back in New York. As actually, huh, it was the summer of '77 that uh, people had asked me. You know, people had uh, had asked me, and the, the the gentleman I mentioned named Bart Andrews had written a book. I've been trying to write a book for two or three years. And I was sending a, around presentations to people and everybody, everybody in the publishing business said, no one wants to read about an old TV show. Now, mm -hmm. if you'll write about Saturday Night Live or whatever was the hot show at the moment, we'll buy it. Mm. But no one cares about a show that went off 10 years ago. 
Bart was out here in Los Angeles writing a, a, almost the exact same book, and he was getting the exact same responses. We each had stacks this big of rejection letters. My presentation landed at Dutton, and a guy called me up. He said, I don't believe this. I just bought this book yesterday, but it was written by a gentleman in Los Angeles called Bart Andrews. Do you know Bart? I said, never heard of him. He said, well, he's coming to New York in a couple of weeks. So I want you to get together. We became friends. Like I say, he became an agent and put together most of the book deals I've had. But what was the question? We were talking about the creation of the uh, okay. Loving Lucy so fan his, conventions, his book, too. His book, his book was very uh, successful, and he was going to have a paperback come out right away. And so he, I said, well, you know, people have been asking me about a fan club. This might be, and, and he was getting inundated with people asking about the fan club. And so... Uh, He and I verbally decided, okay, let's get one off the ground. And he decided he would promote it in the paperback version of his book. Well, that sucker sold. Thank you very much. And don't you know, a week or two later, CBS decided I should move to Los Angeles. So I, <laughs> a dear friend of mine who I'd worked with at CBS volunteered to go to the post office every week take all the mail that was addressed to the Lucy fan club, put it in a pouch and send it out to Los Angeles. And so anyway, we, the fan club became a national thing, if not an international thing. And after a few years, people started asking, could we get together and have a convention? Now, oddly enough, a lady friend of mine at CBS back in the seventies named Joan Winston, she was working in the legal department and the research department had a tiny Xerox machine in those early days. And but the legal department had this fabulous, the sophisticated state of the art thing. And so I would go up there. If I had a, if I had one or two pages, I would Xerox sit down in the research department. But if I had a book or a big report, I would go up. So, so anyway, this lady in the research in the law department, you know, we became friends because I had to pass her desk every time I was using their machine. And she, one day she looked nervous. I said, Joan, what's wrong? <laughs> she said, oh, my, some friends and I are may have done a damn fool thing. I don't know. But this weekend we're putting on a convention. And she knew I of my affinity for Lucy and all things Desi Lou. And she said, well, you might be interested, too. We're putting on a convention. Now, don't laugh. We're putting on a convention of Star Trek people. And I said, well, sure. Why not? I'll come by on a Saturday afternoon. So we're live forever. It was the very first Trekkie convention. Oh, they yeah. financed it out of their pocketbook. She later wrote a book about how to... How to <laughs> So anyway, conventions had always been in the back of my mind. And so when Bart was suggesting maybe we ought to do something... I, by, that, by the time I was working with Lucy, I brought it up to her and I said, the problem is, to, because we didn't have computers in those days. We did not have cell phones in those days. Everything was done by the mail. I said, And maybe if, faxing, right? Yeah, faxing. Uh, just just a little bit. Just a little bit. Only very big companies that even had the fax access, yeah. So the problem for us was if we were going to do a convention in July, we had to start planning at the previous October. And so when I went to people like Lucille Ball saying, can, can I put you down as definitely going to be there? And she said, when is it? And I'd say, oh, July 15th. She said, this is October. If something, I'll say, yeah, I can say yes now, but if anything comes along in the meantime and I'm like a movie or a TV show or something someplace, I can't say, oh, I can't work July 15th because I got to fly home and do a, <laughs> a convention with Tom. That doesn't work. So, uh, so anyway, it was never possible. So after she passed away, with that in mind, uh, we said, well, we, we can try to get the people who are still with us. Because Gail had gone by then and so had Mary Wicks. And we had a precious few left. 
And so we said, let's do it. Like Joan, you know, it was sort of like we financed it ourselves and we said, uh, let's do it. And the fans turned up. Everybody, and again, we had to announce it in October, but we did everything through the mail and all that sort of stuff. And they were very successful. And we did it from 96 to 2001, which was the 50th anniversary of the show. And we thought that was a good place to stop. Plus, three and a half, four weeks later was 9-11. And travel, travel in this country stopped. Yeah. No one wanted to travel across town, let alone across country. So yeah. with that in mind, that happened 9-11 of September. By October, normally I had written a check to reserve space at the hotel and at the, you know, the convention centers and that sort of thing. So everybody was saying, you can't, we don't know what it's going to be like next. Whatever. So Lucy Arnaz had suggested, let's focus our attention instead on the various things that are happening in Jamestown, New York, where they are building a Lucy Desi museum and that sort of thing. And so that sort of became the focus of attention rather than our conventions out here. So it all worked out fine. It's just that we stopped doing our little conventions. Did you miss it? Yes. Yeah. It was, wow. That was a very, no, there was a definitive no. yes. <laughs> and it was fun. It was fun. It was very. It was a New York yes. <laughs> it was a New York yes, exactly. The nice thing for us that was totally <laughs> shock was we had in the back of our mind the thought that all these celebrity people knew each other. And of course, they knew each other, but that didn't mean they still hung out together. So yeah, Bob and Madeline were a team. So they lived a few blocks away from each other. But a lot of these other people, we had the director, the, all the surviving directors, the other two writers with Bob Schiller and Bob Weisskopf. Uh, we had some of the directors like Billy Asher lived down in Palm Springs. We brought all of these people together and for the, it was a reunion for them, you know. And so it, they spent time backstage in the green room going, oh, my God, I haven't seen you in years. And so for us, that was, it was fabulous to be, to be like that. Plus, Madeline was blown away because a lady came up to her in the very first convention and said, I named my daughter after you. Wow. And Madeline, Madeline cornered me a little time later, and she said, I wanted to cry. She said, I didn't know anybody ever knew our names. I said, your name was in their living room every single time that show aired. Of course they knew right. your name. But right. she didn't, they had never met the fans, the producers, the writers, the directors. They were behind the scenes. Lucy and the cast had interfaced with fans their entire life. The, but the the uh, the behind the scenes people really didn't and so it was a wonderful thing i thought that they got to see how appreciated their work was and some of them you know the, the, the fans know these lines you know they can just rattle them off you know favorite lines from favorite yeah. shows. And, you know, these people would go, oh, my God, how do they remember that? Well, they've seen mm -hmm. it 40,000 times. You wrote it right. once. <laughs> right. <laughs> so anyway, you... <laughs> it was fun for everybody, you know. Yeah. You also were involved with classic moments from I Love Lucy, the quotable I Love Lucy, and Color Me Lucy. Tell us about those as well. Me, I did not do the drawings, but I did right. like the, the phrases at the bottom type of thing. But those were those were fan, basically fan, not fan base, but it, they were things that we thought the fans would like. It's almost like merchandise, but not quite. But they were designed. Oh, that 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 was fun too. That came out of my second career. After all this was said and done, CBS decided they were going to start issuing the I Love Lucy and uh, the Lucy Show on DVD. Thank God for technology. And out of that evolved the, the, the decision to maybe we could colorize some of it. And so the first one you showed was the color, the color things. Yeah, things like that. And uh, that had to be a painstaking process.
process to do it, huh? Yeah, it's a company called West Wing Studios, and they were located all over the world. I think so most of the uh, pen and ink people are actually in India, believe it or not. Yeah. Uh, but uh, anyway, yeah, we did. We've got 16 of them, and they they aired most of them in prime, all of them in prime time at least once. And uh, we hope we can do some more one of these days. So, a funny money special. Yeah, that was a great one, huh? Oh yeah, oh yeah. All of our shows hold up is the thing that uh, the Christmas the special. Fact, the fact that you and I are talking, you know, in the year twenty, what is it, twenty twenty three? Lady has been gone thirty five years. This, and she had stopped a few years before. I mean, she wasn't working exactly when she left us. So my point is. Wow. Yeah. Her work, you know, has gone has will live forever in my mind anyway. And so as far as the colorization and being involved in the prize that you became CBS had uh, approached you. And I, I remember um, how exciting it was to see Doug Denoff is a friend and you probably know Doug, his father, Sam Denoff, who was involved with yeah, Dick right. Van Dyke and so much more. Right. And to see Lucy colorized and then also what they did with the dick van dyke show Thank which was fantastic right right yeah so, and, so, and, I and think dick was involved in uh, it with those projects and so he could uh, help advise them like okay the wall was really green so let's make it green and da, 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 da. whereas you know most of the people involved with the isle of lucy's were gone at that point but still and then there's that this too. Great. Let's talk to Lucy. That was a radio show that yes, I had those tapes. There was there was like 200 tapes under my desk. But I was working with Lucille. There was a whole big crate of, of audio tapes. And these are the ones that Lucy Hernandez sort of brought back and shared, right? right with everybody? Exactly. No one knew what to do with them. You know. Yes. Like, right. Show, you know. Incredible stuff. Her it's chatting with so many iconic yeah. people too. Fabulous. It's fabulous to hear. Wow. Now, there's one thing, though, that drove me up a wall, i got to admit. <laughs> <laughs> she would have someone like Eve Arden on, and because this thing was a CBS show every morning on radio for like 10 minutes, Monday through Friday, for a year, uh, it was designed for the housewife. So even Lucy are sitting there sharing recipes, you know, and I think, no, I want to know what it was like, you know, when you were in the movies together, you know, how was this? How was that? But they weren't talking, you know, showbiz trivia. They were talking about putting too much salt in the hamburger. Like, like, the, yeah. the like they were at each other's house having coffee. Yeah. Yeah. It was like a coffee clatch, you know, yeah. that's sort yeah. of thing. And, he was talking about the trip she took to Europe and all this kind of stuff. It was fun, but like I say, the the research guy in me and the Hollywood guy in me and the TV historian in me, I wanted to know what it was like working together back in anyway. Yeah. But, but they're still so much fun to see and to listen to. So the do they plan to colorize and uh broadcast on cbs more of the i love lucy's that it's no one's ever said no it's we all got everything got shut down with covid yeah so we haven't done any since 2019 but uh there's constant in every year at this time because we used to do a, an annual christmas show right so uh at this time of year everybody keeps coming to me and saying are you going to do one this year well we're not we're not doing one in 23 but that doesn't mean we were also doing a spring hour, an hour in the spring and then the Christmas one. And we're hoping we're trying to get some uh, excitement going for it again because the audience is clearly requesting him. And then the superstar specials. Tell those, us about that. Those are part of the spring ones. Those that's, are the spring, yeah. yeah. Which is that's exciting to have had that opportunity to be a part of that, too, huh? Oh, definitely. Definitely. Well, we were part of the team that uh, put the shows together and also supervise the editing because 
uh, the uh, commercial load in 2010 yes. or whenever, you know, whenever we started, we started these in 2013, the commercial load had changed since 1957. And so uh, a little bit, right? <laughs> you're lucky now to get 45 minutes of show in an hour. Everything else is. They don't play credits and show opens and themes are like nothing. It's just like boing and the show is on, <laughs> and, and, you know, and, you know, yeah. Hey, you know, you see a show, you can go take a shower while the commercials are on, come back, think you missed it. Oh, no, they're not back from the commercial break yet. You know, and, and it's still going right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. This is cool, too. And this is another one, the part of the Christmas special. Right. Um, what, when you guys were working on it, you know, as with that phenomenal opportunity when CBS said, you know, we want you to serve as executive producer of CBS television's I Love Lucy, the colorized primetime specials, which you did from 2013 to what 2020 at least. Uh, was there any internal nervousness about taking the black and white original versions yes. and yes. colorizing them? Yes. Like, for example, could you imagine if they were to... There's been other versions of it, but not of the original. I don't know. I think it was fabulous with I Love Lucy and I love them, but I don't know I would want to see the original Twilight Zones colorized. Uh, I can't answer that. I, I, but part of the mystique of the Twilight Zone is that I think the black and white adds to the eeriness of it, and it's almost a child of noir uh, movies not quite because noir was basically murder mysteries and that sort of thing but what i'm saying is the black and white uh sensibility adds to the story whereas on i love lucy it was simply a presentational comedy so the the, the they were in black and white because that was the norm of the day it wasn't because for any creative decision and to your point the black and white oftentimes became part of the effect of uh, show shadowing and the lighting and yeah, especially with the twilight zone or even like the monsters or some of the others. Uh, and yeah. And the Dick Van Dyke show completely was uh, in black and white and some of it for the viewers watching, not realizing some of this, I guess with some series, there was opportunities to go color because it was so expensive. Some of them elected not to like Jeannie, well, I dream of Jeannie first year, black and white. Then they went into color. Originally, I believe it was the fall of 55. Cause I, when I was at CBS, I found a lot of documents and whatnot in the fall of 55. CBS was toying in the early 50s, color belonged to NBC. Boom, boom, boom. This program is brought to you in living color on NBC, and the peacock would spread its feathers. Uh, CBS stayed away from it basically because NBC was uh, owned by RCA, and RCA was making money off of color TV sets. And neither ABC or CBS had such a situation going. And so they said, why should we do color and uh, simply feather uh, RCA's finances? But anyway, they thought, okay, color seems to be here to stay. Let's do some tests. And they did. They thought they'd take one episode of a lot of their shows and do color samples. And CBS, and they chose one of the Hollywood episodes. Uh, of I Love Lucy, and it was going to be done, I think, like in October, November, whatever the production schedule would allow. And in the meantime, both Jack Benny and Burns and Allen, George Burns, Gracie Allen, did color shows. Now, you and I, living in a modern world, and even them, even they, in that less modern world, thought, oh, well, just use color film. Mm -hmm. Mm -mm. In addition to color film, you had to have a brand new color camera. I mean, the same film didn't, it, it, trust me, they needed different cameras. The lights all had to be reset and sometimes changed. The, the well, the very drab 
most of the sets were built and painted with the idea that they would be in black and white. So that could be some of that stuff did not necessarily look fabulous together mm -hmm. because all that was the image they wanted. They wanted that black and white image. Now, if you're going to do that exact scene in color, those, the walls and everything, some of them had all, anyway, by the time the Jack Benny and the Burns and Allen shows had been done in color, the price was through the roof. And the fonts said, you're not, don't expect us to pick up all that, that do you? I mean, our agreement was, we're, we're our budget, we're budgeted for the normal half hour episodes, which was this. Now suddenly this is like, you know, not almost double. See, I said, oh, that's, not, that's not doable. <laughs> so I Love Lucy never had a color episode. For, for a while, they, we thought they might have, but it was canceled because of cost overrun, which is what we were saying from the beginning, was it costs so much more to do it in color because suddenly wardrobe, does this shirt look good with that background? Oh, no, well, then I need a new shirt or we need to change the background. If the shirt is just a shirt, hand me the red one. If it's, if it's key to the story, then we have to change the back. And so it became very weird. And none of that had been taken into consideration. And so they did a couple of specials, I think, at Christmas time. CBS said, yeah, color is nice. Let's put it away for a while. And it was like the mid-60s before CBS and ABC really jumped on the color wagon. So came around right exactly with uh colorized versions or color versions of some of the, right. the shows even bewitched started in black and white and then eventually went yeah, into I think, I think they did two years and then and i think they wanted to do the last year of the van dyke show in color but dick said no let's finish it all let's just do them all so that they're together as it was done you also had involvement with the andy griffith christmas special too right, right? tell us about right. that well, that was fun because, uh, well, because we, enjoy, first of all, we enjoyed doing them, you know, adding color to these classics, but uh, they had done, they wanted to do a, an Andy Griffith, the CBS specials had been doing so well, that they thought, what else could we do? And the Andy Griffith things was, also has this huge popularity of huge fan base. And so they thought, okay, we'll do that. And so they did the Christmas show and it required a bonus episode because you went an hour out of it. And so they did one called the pickle show or the pickle mm. episode, which where uh, Aunt B enters a pickle contest at the fair. The one thing we discovered was I, first of all, I, I, as a child, as a viewer, as a 12 year old viewer had been a very faithful viewer uh, to father knows best. So mm. I sort of grew up watching Eleanor Donahue. And so when it went off the air in the spring of 1960, she came back a couple of months later as the, as as part of the Andy Griffith show. I always thought it was kind of weird that she disappeared after a year, but I've later read in all the books that they didn't know how to write for a female character. It's really Andy and Barney's show, and somehow the girlfriends all became interchangeable for a while and anyway they didn't know how exactly what to do with her and so but that first episode the first season the announcer says the andy griffith show starring andy griffith co-starring eleanor donahue and don knotts when it went into syndication they used the later versions it simply says the andy griffith show starring andy griffith co-starring Don Knotts and poor Eleanor didn't have any credit because uh, when they reran the, the first season, because they used the same opening for everything. And, and there was no, and at the end, because they got in those days, if you got credit at the top of the show, you didn't necessarily get credit at the end of the show. And they, they didn't, the cast did not, the regular cast did not get, a credit at the end. So she wasn't mentioned at all because they took her, her verbal out and there was nothing at the end. So anyway, we made sure that Eleanor Donahue got credit in that special when it was aired. I don't know if she noticed or not, but anyway, it's after nice. all those years, it's about time she got credit. She's fabulous and she's still with us, thank God. And, and 
that house was on that Warner Ranch, too, that they used. And that was used, I think, for a couple of different TV shows, right? The House of yeah, Jews with Father Knows Best? Most of that was on the old Desi Lou lot down in Culver City, and it's been gone for years. It was also the same lot where they filmed Superman and things like that in the 50s. Uh, it was the old RKO back lot. That's that right. Back of the Culver lot. And That's right. Yeah. Really well, cool. A lot of times you see some of the Mayberry building showing up in the, the, the original Superman episodes. Our mutual friend, Michael Stern, we, uh, when I was on a television shoot in Los Angeles, I let him know and we had gotten together and we went around the Paramount lot because he was doing, he was working right. with Dr. Phil at the time and went all around Paramount, which of course, Desi Lou was there uh, prior. We had, I don't, you're, I'm sure you've been there, but there was this wonderful restaurant. Uh, I believe it's a, if I recall, it was a Latin restaurant that was right across the street from where Desi Lu was. And I believe the street says something like uh, Desi Lu or Desi Ones or Lucio Ball Road or Avenue or something. Do you know of that restaurant where they used to frequent all the time? It was, well, there was, it used to be one called Nicodel's. It's gone, but the one I think you're mentioning is, is called Lucy's, but it's right. spelled different. I think it's E Y S. Yes, and right. It's, uh, it's a, a Mexican restaurant there. And yeah, it's it's Lucy Square, I think. Square. Yeah. Exactly. Hey, look what we uh, dug up, my friend. This will take uh, you and our viewers uh, back a little bit. Uh, tell us when this was. Ah! <laughs> that was CBS in about 19... Nice turtleneck, very spiffy. That was actually at Ball State University. That was like 1968. And that was, I, I was a uh, program director of the radio station there. And so, Yeah, uh, you were getting your feet wet even back then, huh? I, good God, I had hair then. <laughs> I should have kept it, huh? <laughs> so you knew early on you wanted to get into broadcast... I knew right from the cradle that I had to be part of television. Radio never in, never interested yeah. me as much as it did my parents because they had grown up right. with radio. Yeah. For me, I was like, where am I supposed to be looking? Because I mean, I because when I was a child, child, radio was still on. It, it didn't totally die until right. mid to later fifties, and so you could still hear you know, Lone Ranger and things like that on the radio, a whole different cast than what we got on TV, but uh, it, it seemed half missing somehow. I knew I had to be part of television. I never Visual. watched one of the movies. I mean, they were fine, but I mean, I'm, first of all, I'm not a t an actor. I'm, but television, I had to be part of. And yeah. like I say, I would have sold them, not because there's anything wrong with selling them. That's what my dad did. Uh, I needed to be part of it because I knew what that TV set screen had done for me. I had internalized it, you know, from the very beginning. Me and too, right. right. You knew all the TV themes, the jingles, probably call letters to the stations. I mean, just yeah. about everything and probably had your little cassette recorder and doing things, I, plays in the garage. Tapes. We did all of that. Yes. I audio tapes I, Panasonic TV. cassette recorder with a microphone and interviewing the family. <laughs> well, yeah. I still have all that stuff. Do you still have all of that? Did you save it? Some of it, not all of it. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I kept it. Now, um, the Lucy show. Right. Were you involved at that as well, in that as well? Yes. I yeah. produced those six seasons on DVD. We took we went and a lot of the stuff that we were able to uh, find the commercials and some of the what we call bonus material uh, hadn't been seen in since they were originally done because they were things uh, done to promote the series and that sort of thing. CBS didn't even know they had it, you know, because well people left and new people came in and the new people don't know what the old inventory was and they're just hitting the road running and whatever. And I reminded them, well, you know, there used to be this and there used to be that. And, and anyway, they got into the vault and they found stuff that they didn't know existed. And so we were able to access a lot of it for to be put on these discs as bonus material. And we found some of the original commercials because as with the Griffith people and with Dick Van Dyke, 
there was usually what they called the cast commercial that was always at the end of the show, not in the middle, uh, where either the star or someone in the cast would come out and talk about the sponsor's wonderful product, and uh, they did the last commercial. And a lot of those, of course, aired once, because even if you had the same sponsor, if your show was being repeated in May, and let's say it was a November commercial, the people might be dressed totally for the, the November snow bundle, you know, the snow clothes you're wearing wouldn't be appropriate for May, June repeat. So they those old commercials may have been used once and then stored. And so it's fun to dig those things out and find them again. And like I said, a lot of them, people didn't even know they existed. So that was fun. I love getting into vault finding things. We found Lucy and Bessie's I Love Lucy uh, makeup tests, wardrobe tests. Did you really? And it's on the... Uh, the I Love Lucy Blu-ray. It was in uh, Bob Osborne, who was one of Lucy's protégés, agreed to, he did, he hosted it for me, he did your job, and uh, he presented it for uh, our DVD, our Blu-ray audience, where uh, he'd never seen it before either. And it was silent, which is the only sad part, but it was then, putting on clothes, because like I say, most of their stuff were things they brought from home, and she said, you could see that she's saying, I need a new hairdo, and she did, because it was that 1940s look, and she developed what became the classic uh, Lucy Ricardo look, but, you know, things like that have been moldering in the vaults for 50 years, and I said, what's that, you know, I don't know, let's get it out. <laughs> Whoa. Now, you also had an opportunity to work with Lucio Ball Productions, right? Right. After, at the same time and after Life with Lucy, it's all part of the same moment. What was that like, having that opportunity? Oh, it was wonderful. It was really wonderful. And uh, she was in constant demand. She didn't do everything that was asked of her. In fact, we turned down Quite a lot. She was actually offered different scripts at different times, you know, things that I read at first. If I thought they were any good, I'd pass them on to Gary. He'd look at them and take them home if he thought. The thing was, she was part of that older star group that included Betty Davis at the, and Catherine Hepburn and people of that nature who were trying to work, but everybody looked at them as old people. And Lucy said, I don't want to play an old person. I want to play a person who happens to be old. But it, she didn't want, they would be, you know, things set in a retirement home or something like that. That was not what she wanted to do. She wanted to do a story, you know, if it's a murder mystery, fine. Uh, she just happened to be old in it, that sort of thing. In other words, age was not supposed to be an element. And this funny thing is, she and Catherine Hepburn were on opposite coasts, but they still knew and liked each other a whole lot. And occasionally Kate would call in and say, did you get that script about the sheriff? <laughs> you know? and, and they had, they had gotten... The, you know, the scripts were making the rounds. If one of these big stars turned it down, then whoever was doing the pitch would ask the other one. They didn't know that all these ladies were knew each other. <laughs> Did you get that? <laughs> it's terrible. You know, it's not. And, and I, I no, I, I don't want anybody to think it was terrible. I want people to think that was the element, though. They wanted stories that had to do with people who just happened to be, you know over a certain age that but that they didn't want the age to be the plot you know yeah so that kind of i guess difficult right here you are you're on television all these years and then you know it, it's even tougher now right it's with the age thing and a lot of people are there's a lot of uh, blowback on it. People are like, hey, come on, you know, seasoned veterans are seasoned veterans and they should be appreciated and there should be a place for them as well. It's a, it's a, I see, the, I do, sword. 
it's a two it's a two way street. It's two it part. It really hurts too, but in because in this day and age, it's not only your stars, but it's the creative people as well. Your writers, directors, producers, people who just happen to be over fifty-five or whatever, over thirty-five. Oh, you're a has been because somebody somewhere made the decision that if you want to reach people who are eighteen to thirty-four, you have to be a person that's eighteen to thirty-four. And you couldn't possibly be 55 and write something that those people would be interested in. And I think there, there's a lot of talent being overlooked because of that. You know, the whole idea that, oh, you're out of our age demo. Oh, I can't use words like that even on this show. <laughs> <laughs> demo. <laughs> you know, you know, that's wrong. Uh, talent is talent. And if it's a good story, it doesn't matter what the age of the 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 so script writer is. I'm sorry. I, and I feel that in reverse. When I was first trying to get into television, I tried writing a few scripts and people would say, well, you're young. Uh, you know, after you're around a while, you'll, you know, you'll apprentice with people and learn da 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 Once and you I, get your feet wet, improve yourself. Yeah. And yeah. The attitude was, you know, you're not good when you're first starting. I think that's wrong, too. To me, a good story is a good story. A good script is a good script. Just like a good acting performance is a good acting performance. And I don't care what the age of the person involved is. And I think a lot of talent is being overlooked on both ends of the spectrum simply because the person doing the hiring is the has got a prejudicial point of view. But somebody made their decisions, and anyway. <laughs> and now there's AI coming in, a lot of other things oh, that change the game. Yeah, that scares me to death, because if somebody records what we just did and takes our words and feeds them into a memory bank, they can have a Jim Masters or a Tom Watson saying almost anything they wanted to, as long as they're using our words out of this conversation. And that's freaking too unless they give us big fat checks and we can stay home and, <laughs> yeah, and no. relax a little yeah. bit <laughs> also i don't want but otherwise i don't yeah cloning copying one of, elements, one of the elements something you just said i don't mind checking my finger at you you just said something you said as long as we're getting paid well what they want to do is pay us for what we just did. And then they want in and then that's it. And they want in perpetual rights to your image and yeah. voice. And, voice and they do not want to give either Jim or Tom rights to uh say their yes. own image, yeah. Yeah, use they might they could use your image or your voice any way they choose. Right. That's, that's wrong. Right. Yeah, that I've is so many actors over the course of my life. It's what they're fighting are, for now. Yeah. have turned down parts because they did not want to be associated with either the story or the situation. They said, no, I, I just assume not. I appreciate the offer, but no, thank you. And they went on and got somebody else. When, they, when somebody owns your image, even your vocal image, yeah, they have a, Jim Masters once said, and then something taken totally out of contact. Nefarious it, could happen. Yeah, that's wrong. I'm sorry if that's wrong. So, right, and exactly. this Lucy stuff has shown these things live perpetually. I mean, things she recorded, you know, in 1951 are still being used. So that's 80 years ago, 70 years ago. So I'm sorry, I, AI and all that is just wrong. We uh, dug up something else that's kind of uh, cool, and you can tell us when you had an opportunity to meet this person. Let's see if we can find it. It's in here somewhere. It's hidden away. It's dug in. It's something really cool. Where did it go? Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. There it is. Debbie Reynolds. Debbie Reynolds. That was in New York at one of the uh, Tony Awards. Uh, she was doing a Broadway play. I think that was probably. Oh, she was doing Irene. I think. Mm. When was this one? 
mid 70s, 76, mm. 77, something and like that. And you were with CBS at the time, yeah. CBS. Now, the funny thing is to, to see how times have changed. When I was living in New York and the Tony Awards were on ABC, usually on a Sunday night type of thing, uh, I would call up the, uh, the guy's name, I who Alex and Hildy Hart, no, Alexander, somebody or other was the producer. I can't think of the name. Anyway, they were giving away seats. Because I would call, I'd say, I'm on, I work over at CBS, which I realize your folks are on ABC. But I said, do you by any chance have any seat filler seats available or anything at all? Because some friends and I would just love to come over on Sunday night and see the show. How many do you need? Right. <laughs> this is like on Friday night and the show is on Sunday. They couldn't give away those suckers. Today, you know, the Emmy Awards are, but in those days, the, no, the, the Tony Award. The Tony Awards were totally a Broadway thing, and most people outside of Manhattan or out on you know west of the Hudson had never seen these shows, and so the ratings were sort of eh, you know, and so the, the, there wasn't a big clamor for tickets to see the broadcast, and I just happened to lock in because I you know I I. I called you off at the production office and do you have any tickets? Yeah, how many do you need? <laughs> <laughs> today, forget it. They're like the Oscars, you know, their tickets are gone way in advance and there's more people working in the Broadway theater than they could possibly accommodate. Now it's coveted, yeah. right? Yeah. Now you uh, you still stay in touch with uh, some folks too, like Lucy Arnaz, huh? Right, definitely. That was just a f two or three years ago. And that's Michael Stern, of course, and Wanda Clark, who Lucille, Lucy Arnaz has got her hand on her. That was Lucille Ball's secretary for over 30 years. And Frank Gorey was uh, a gentleman that uh, we were there actually for his birthday party. He's like 80 something. And uh, he had been a uh, sort of major domo, if that's the right word, for mm -hmm. Lucy and Gary uh, at the Beverly Hills home actually since the mid fifties, you know? And so he started his first job at Desi Lou was to drive Desi Arnaz around town because Desi Lou owned three different studio lots. Mm -hmm. and even back then, uh, traffic was bad in Los Angeles. And when you're driving, that's all you can do, obviously. Well, by taking a limousine, uh, he could be in the back. He could, dictate uh, memos, he could read scripts, he could do all sorts of things in the back seat. And so Frank's first job from like 1958 or so was to drive Desi from studio to studio to studio. And then mm -hmm. when Lucy came to New York to do Wildcat, uh, he came with her and uh, basically took care of the apartment and took the kids to school and that sort of thing. So he was part of their family behind the scenes for 40 years. Uh, one of the viewers, William Graff says, uh, is the name Alexander Cohen? Yes, it's Al uh, yeah, Alex and Hildy, yes. I knew it was Alex and Hildy was his wife and she usually wrote the scripts. I couldn't think of the last name. <laughs> now, Bill, I know, I know Bill Graff. Uh, welcome to the show, uh, Bill. It's a pleasure to have you here. And a lot of our viewers have been commenting. They've already said you're a gym master show lovity. How cool is that, uh, Tom, huh? Lovity, yes. Isn't that great? Love and lovity put together. I just happened to stumble on that during the pandemic. Uh, what are some things that, uh, you know, you've really enjoyed about this wonderful career, something you dreamed about early on in Indiana? Yeah, and you, you, you made your way to New York, L.A., the big time, and, you, you know, uh, what what are the beautiful things that I think that you do as part of this dream pursuit is you are preserving and celebrating and shining the light on classic television and the people that made it happen and what it was like and, and sort of giving it a second uh, life uh, being very gingerly aware of 
the importance of remembering and celebrating. And I think that's a, it's a beautiful thing that you have been doing, Tom. Oh, thank you. It's not, it was not what I would call a goal. It's just that that's where my heart is. And it just sort of, that's the way I am type of thing. <laughs> and uh, I, 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 I've just been terribly, terribly lucky. First of all, to have had all the experiences I did and to wind up, first of all, working for the lady and then having the opportunity or recently to take the classic shows and be partially responsible, not nowhere near totally, but at least to have a little finger in the putting those shows back on primetime television, now in color, and it's like, pinch me. I never thought in my wildest dreams that I Love Lucy would ever again be on network television in primetime. I mean, that never happens. They wind up on a cable network or they wind up being streamed in modern time. But to see that on primetime took my breath away. It was like, mm -hmm. oh, my God. Yeah. So that's why we're hoping to maybe get some more of them going. Uh, but anyway, no, I've just been terribly, terribly blessed and lucky, you know, to uh, to meet people and sort of follow. I won't say I had a plan. These things just sort of happened, right? You were there. Okay. And Jim writes me an email a couple of months ago saying, you want to do my, sh my show? I didn't plan this. You did. But it. It's sort of, you know, you, you go with what comes your way. And it's amazing the people you can meet. It's really cool. Like I said at the beginning when we were chatting off air, it's a small world. We have a lot of mutual friends and folks in the, these industries that we're in. And uh, it, it's really, really something. And and again, we're in these industries because we love it. Like you said, right. you, you loved it as a kid. Yeah, I, I love it as a kid. To fall back on. I mean, I have no... No other interest other than being in TV in some way, shape, or form. I just don't. There's nothing else that captures my imagination. Captures you. Um, what about internet streaming and all of that? Because television, of course, and, and of course radio, but television right now is going through a, a new evolution, a metamorphosis. Things are changing and evolving with television, viewership, and all of that. Uh, streaming and all of these platforms are starting to go like this. How do you feel about all of uh, that? Yeah, it's hard to know how it's all going to land because so much is changing. And I am definitely, you know, of the came out of the old school where, you know, Lucy was on CBS every Monday night type of thing, as opposed to having these things streamed. And the streaming that I don't understand is uh, why we have to get a whole season's worth at once, you know, the whole bi uh, TV binging type of thing. Yeah, I know when I get the, my DVDs out and maybe I'll watch one episode or maybe I'll watch two or three back to back. But, but to have that be a way of life, I can't imagine that. Uh, one other thing that scares me because it's so totally not Tom Watson, that is I love to own things. The tangible, tactile experience. Yes, yes. You know, yes. The I Love Lucy DVDs, for example, you know, I never in my life when I was growing up thought it would be possible to own my own personal copy of every single episode. It just didn't. It You couldn't, first of all. Secondly, you know, and the whole thought I own my own personal DVD of Gone with the Wind. That's the most celebrated movie of all time. Maybe some people like it, some people don't, but it, this was the movie that defined Hollywood in the 40s. And to own your own personal copy, are you crazy? People didn't do that. There were film collectors that had 16 millimeter films under their beds, surreptitiously type of thing and that sort of whatnot. But the mere fact that kids today, I'm Younger people today, particular. I mean, you know, the, the younger generation doesn't want that. They just assume stream it, and they don't want to own things. You know, they don't want a shelf full of books. They don't want a shelf full of discs. They don't even want a shelf full of CDs. I mean, 
you know, I grew up on vinyl. So, you know, the, I had 45s and 33s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that scares me in so far as I don't know what's around the next, I don't know what's coming next. If that's, if that's, you know, because if we don't, if we lose all of this and the streaming service decides it's no longer beneficial, it's no longer profitable to stream I Love Lucy, then what happens? You know, where do people get it? Because they're not going to be running on, you know, network television or on TV stations anymore. And, and it's all expensive too. You have to have all of these. You got to subscribe to this, to this, to this, to this, to this. Have a stellar star show. And every time I somebody tells me, "Oh, have you seen the new Mutantivimus show?" and I say, "No," <laughs> what's the well? Then they mention a service that I've never heard of, and it's only nine dollars a month. You can afford nine dollars a month, yeah, but that one's nine dollars. The other one was it's, eight. The other yeah. one was seven fifty. The other one's twenty-two. And by the time you add it all up, you know, it's like, "Hello, I go back. I grew up with the a antenna house. on the roof. <laughs> the antenna on the roof. Where everything was free, right?" Because made pep you know the pepsi cola people and right. the Philip Morris cigarettes and whatnot they paid for it i got it for free and i i'm sorry <laughs> me that i have to pay and if a windstorm knocked it down dad get up on the ladder go on the roof and just put it back up <laughs> the antenna right so <laughs> there was a beauty to that boy, yeah I don't know and so i think that's one reason Preservation is even more important now than yeah. ever because you yes. don't know what's coming. And right. if somebody's throwing away and not keeping copies of things. Of anything, yeah. And what happens to the companies that essentially are doing the streaming? If they decide to go out of business. Correct. Well, I mean, for example, give a good example. Well, they didn't go out of business, but they just stopped doing it. One of my uh, favorite shows, lots of them, like you, I love television, I love shows, all of it, was one of Aaron Spelling's dramatic series. And I believe if I'm correct, I think he was quoted in a magazine that of all the series that he did, the one that he was the most proud of was Family with Seda Thompson, oh, yes, love that show. James Broderick, Meredith Baxter Burney, Gary Frank, Kristen McNichol, Quinn yes. Cummings. Uh, and Sony had done it, released it on DVD. So super, and it wasn't airing in reruns on any television, local stations, nostalgic channels, uh, Antenna TV, Pluto, me, none of them were running it at the time. So when they were really, you know, coming out with all these great series, you know, you'd run to the stores or you'd go online. Oh, wow. They just put the whole series of this classic show on DVD. You can get it. And you felt like you, it, like you're saying, you can't believe you have it in your hand. And it was like a score and you can watch it whenever you want. And the bonus back material, the original commercials, some of the outtakes, all of it. And with family, they only put, I think the first, three seasons on DVD, Sony, and they were supposed to continue the series and finish it off with all the later episodes. They stopped. They never did it. So there's nowhere on DVD where the rest, other than the first three seasons of Family, exists on professionally produced DVDs anywhere. It just, they just stopped it. And people have written to them. You've seen it online. Oh, please finish it. Please. We love that series. Please. please, please. And, uh, and now the nostalgic channels have started, you know, antenna TV, I think has done, uh, or one of the nostalgic they've do these binge weekends where all weekend it's family all weekend. It's manix or whatever, but still to not have completed it. So it's to your point of what if a company decides we're just not worth the investment or just not going to, continue well, showing or airing or making it available the thing that yes and carry that one step further back is all these companies have been bought and sold and bought and sold and bought and sold and a lot of times new owners say why do we need all of that type of thing and 
I'm hoping that the people who are making the decisions have our type of appreciation for the history because, you know, if they don't preserve it uh, right along, then as technology advances, even if there's something there that, I mean, if they keep it, but they don't enrich it with the new technology, can you even play it anymore? One of the things at CBS was uh, they did a lot of, from the late 50s in through early 70s, they did a lot of their big specials were on videotape, these big two-inch videotapes. Well, I think there's maybe two or three good machines left in this town that can play them. You know? Yes, right. It's like, oh, oh my God. Uh, what happens once those machines break? You know, it's like, so it's, and that's true of all this new technology. Uh, we have to be able to use what we, and that just go, even other nature sometimes plays tricks on us. Uh, I remember there was a big fire a few years ago on the back lot of Universal, and one of the storage sheds had all their lot of old film in it, and there are some of the lesser titles, but they're still TV shows that got ruined, you know, because they were involved in that fire. And it's like, oh, those were the, those are the masters, you know, those are the master copies of this. So the people who are involved with all of these things have to have a certain appreciation for it and not the attitude of why do we need that? You know, they made that in 1986. Why do we need that today? No one cares. That's the part that scares the shit out of me because there's no, there's nothing, you know, there's no national archives or anything like that. There's no financing of, in all fairness to the, these people who are trying to make a, a budget of their, you know, what their corporation spends every year. It's hard to say it's important you need to hang on to those films that were made in 1986. Someday they may be useful again. If I'm asking him to pay rent or to spend money on preserving them, it depends on how what his sensibilities are. So I understand both sides. It's just that, you know, it's delicate. You know, I might be biased because of my last name, but I'm a big believer in making sure that you hang on to the masters. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. It's very, very important. <laughs> no, it's true, though. It's true because yeah, know, there are some things where we just don't. And I've even there are even some motion pictures that they put out on DVD. Right. And they'll say this print was or this disc was made from the best available elements and that mm. means the negatives gone Even yeah they, they found a good print or a decent print and they uh you know who was smart was johnny carson with the tonight show right because nbc was just sort of throwing the tapes out not preserving it and i think he had said wait a minute we let's you know and, and i'll own them uh smart early on right Right, right. Yeah. No, they used to do that. The lady I mentioned, Joan Winston at CBS in the law department, the lady sitting next to her used to call up people and say, Jim, you were on the such and so show two or three weeks, two or three months ago. Do you have any desire to have a copy of that? And if you say no, that was going to be you reused probably tomorrow's show, tomorrow's guiding light was going to be recorded over. Right. And, uh, Again, it's a space issue, it's a finance issue, and, you know, uh, certainly the Tonight Show and all those shows. The game shows, too, were disposable, yeah. Because, again, these two-inch tapes were huge. Uh, when we were doing the, the Lucy Show DVDs, there were a lot of times Lucy or Viv or someone was on the Mike Douglas Show or the uh, Merv Griffin show, things like that, that was owned by what was that Westinghouse Broadcasting, I think. Out yeah, of Dinah, Dinah Shore show, all those shows, yeah. And, and no missing, I mean, the, the shows we wanted just happened. The masters, the masters are gone because the current owners, I think, are CBS because through corporate mergers, 
the library, there are big chunks missing, and no one knows why. No one knows what ever happened to it because the current people that are of our mindset and wanting them, they have no clue as to what happened to those, you know, those tapes 30 years ago, you know, and no records were kept. So that's mm. why it's important to keep what we can, but, you know. Are you working on any other projects in that yeah, regard? But I'm available. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm not at the moment. I'm not. But uh, you can tell that uh, I'm definitely interested in this kind of thing. So who knows? You mentioned not really being a actor, but is that something you ever considered dipping your feet into? Not really. No. Or voice work? No. Nope. I mean, I haven't. But but he is available for that too, folks. If you <laughs> <laughs> you have a project in mind, right, Tom? <laughs> Uh, tell us before we go, um, I always like to sometimes if we have some time, as you can see, these aren't interviews. These are conversations we have. Um, little Edward or Murrow person, a person on CBS. Uh, we're now at the home of uh, Tom Watson. Tell us about the phenomenal room that you're in and what you are surrounded by there. Tom. Can't you tell? There are, there's, a, there's a certain face all over the room, if you will most of the place anyway, various things. Uh, this is my my rat's nest of an office, and uh, I do all my creative work in here that can be done on computer, and these files are all full of photographs and various information that I have amassed over the years. And there's even- And I love the old school file cabinets and everything, you know, yeah, it's, it, looks, it looks cool. Most people, People don't have all of this kind of stuff anymore. They have it all on, uh, you know, uh, computer disks or hard drives. But two in the morning, it's easier to pull it out of that file than it is to turn everything back on. <laughs> like, Where the hell did I put it? You know? <laughs> Old school. So there you are. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that. The rest of my house does not look like this. That's not done in early redhead, but the uh, the office is. Uh, William Graff says, Tom Watson sings the hits of George M. Cohen. I want that CD. <laughs> A real Yankee doodle dandy, huh? Right. Uh, our viewers have been commenting and, and welcoming uh, you throughout. We've been showing, sprinkling in some of uh, their comments throughout. Thanks for all the lovely and all the great comments uh, throughout the show, everybody. Uh, watching Jason and watching in Wisconsin. Uh, he's in Fond du Lac, home to uh, Fred McMurray, my three sons. Yes. Uh, somebody did ask this is real quick. George Mallory. What do you think, Tom, about the 24-7 I Love Lucy on Pluto TV? I don't get it. I, I don't get Pluto TV. I've heard about it. I think it's fine. I think it's fabulous that it's there. Uh, we went, I went through a period of time, of course, when it was on CBS primetime, and then it went into CBS morning, and then it went into syndication, and then it went into uh, cable networks. And so it, it keeps reinventing itself at whatever the the current technology is so i think as long as the show is being embraced i'm all yeah. for it as long as they are retaining me its integrity some now i've heard from people that they're doing a good job years ago i saw here's lucy on one of the cable services where in order and rather than editing it which can be a sacrilege it's done wrong. Uh, they sped it up because, again, they're going to add more commercial time. It's mm. like he's talking like this instead of the way you're supposed yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. I thought you can't do that, but they did. And so I also, uh, I really love, and we've, we've talked about it with jingle singers and session musicians and others. Uh, Lloyd Schwartz has been on the show and just all well, these fantastic Sid and Marty Croft. And uh, I love the TV themes. I love the jingles. I love the production music, the credits and the theme running after. And a lot of times now, which we've talked about with other guests, they just either squeeze it in the box and the next show is already starting. 
And it's just like they're doing it because they have to, or they just totally eliminate it. Now I know we have, um, I think it's on the remote with some of the channels where it actually asks you if you want to skip the intro, the intro to Maud and all these series. And I'm like, no, I don't want to skip the intro. I want to hear the intro, the singers, the jingles, the instrumental music uh, theme. An integral part of the whole play. It's the buildup and the whole, right. Yeah. There was a CBS show that, uh, well, they used to do it a lot, but the, there was one that, well, I forget the title of it. Anyway, it failed, but the, uh, the sister show was Gilligan's Island. And the theme song told the story of how the people got there. So if you miss, if you leave the theme song out, you have no idea who these people are and why they're on the island. But the theme told the story in 45 seconds, you know, of who the characters are and why they're here on Gilligan's Island. Bang, and you're in the show. But if you leave that out, yeah, today when they, I see TV shows without... That was another gift, thank you, CBS, uh, for when we did the I Love Lucy specials because they had been done at a time before CBS had to all, had to honor the integrity of the Guild rules back then. Thank you, Jesus. And so it opened. It has an opening with the theme music, and at the end. We, we remanufactured the, because we were putting two shows together, so we had the mix. We, we didn't have a credit roll in the middle. We did everything at the end, so we had to redo it, but we had the, we had a real crawl at the, the end. Full, the, the full theme from beginning yeah. to end, yes. and then the CBS television network, I. Right, and... They said nothing about it. I mean, you know, they had that's part of the deal. You have to honor the integrity of the mob. But any, now, if we were producing those brand new today with the brand new cast, they do it the way you describe, where the and all your names were flying by and you don't know who the hell did what. That's, right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. My friend, this was really a conversation, um, as they always are on the Gym Master Show Live. I tell everybody and every guest, if you have 20 minutes, we do 20 minutes. If you have 45, you have an hour, we, we let it roll, and it's conversations. The viewers have been commenting. They've all welcomed you. They said you're a, a lovety on the show, which is really fantastic, like a badge of honor. And uh, this is really terrific. You know, We took uh, an hour, and we expanded it to almost two uh, and it doesn't feel like it, right? Just a oh, good okay. conversation. Just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, hopefully you had dinner. Did you have dinner yet? Because you're on the no, West it's, Coast. It's clock here, so that's fine. Okay, so you're good. Well, well, it's nine here, and we right. still haven't had the dinner yet. It's been one of those crazy busy days. This was a joy and a delight, Tom. That's and for me, I, that's for sure. Oh, I appreciate that. And I hope the show, as I said, everybody met whatever expectations you had and you enjoyed the time with me as much as I absolutely have with you. Definitely. I hope you have me back. We'll come Wait. up with stuff to talk about. Yes, we will definitely keep the porch light on, which I say to everybody as well. You're welcome back. I hope you'll uh, spread the word about our show to everybody and share uh, you know, the episode link on social media and also... If you know other folks you think would like to pop on the show for however long they have, they're all welcome. So spread the word for us on that too, that we really appreciate that, my friend. Will do. Thank <laughs> you so much. It's been fun. It was a pleasure. Absolutely. Thanks for your wit and wisdom and just telling some really fabulous stories and being so real and authentic, which I absolutely love. And Timothy Larson says, fascinating guest, engaging conversation. Thanks, Jim and Tom, Kathleen in New York City says, this has been a fun conversation. Thanks for being here, Tom. William Graff says, thanks, Jim, for having Tom on the show. Wonderful. Uh, we appreciate that. And all the comments from all of our faithful loveties and so many others. Uh, really, really fantastic. And of course, as we always say to everybody that is watching, uh, if you'd like to uh, help us reach even more people around the world, you can do that by doing this. Like, 
this episode, give it a little thumbs up, like on our YouTube channel and leave a comment underneath the episode. Engage with us. We'd love to see what you love about this episode. What's your favorite Isle of Lucy or the Lucy show memory, the colorized versions and some of the other things we talked about and share the episode as well as subscribe to our YouTube channel, Jim Masters TV. We would love that. Tom Watson, you're the best. Uh, love from the East Coast to all your friends back East. I and did. hopefully uh, we will break bread at some point. If you're here on the East Coast or I'm out on a shoot or something, West Coast, I'll certainly let you know, okay? Great. Do that. Do that. I will do that. You be well and uh, take Good. care. And thanks for stopping by the show. It was a pleasure. Loved it. Thank you. All right. Cheers. All right. We don't do the fade to black. We just, <laughs> they just sort of go that way. Uh, what a great conversation, right, gang? This was really terrific as we were celebrating Lucille Ball, yes, but also celebrating television, celebrating Tom's incredible career in television. Dreamed about it as a kid in Indiana and made his way to the big city, to New York, working in the 70s for CBS. And then CBS said, you're a star <laughs> and sent him out to L.A. And then just the rest was history and continues to be. And uh, the wonderful relationship with uh, the franchise of, of everything, really, Lucille Ball from I Love Lucy to, again, uh, the superstar specials, the DVDs, too, as well. And uh, even the Lucy show which is really cool, the colorization, all these great specials, the Superstar special and the Christmas special. He also worked on Life with Lucy, which was the series in 1986. It was the very last series that Lucio Ball was on. It was on ABC. And uh, he shared some behind the scenes of that show and a little bit as far as why he thought it didn't take, it didn't last Unfortunately, he's also worked on the uh, colorized Andy Griffith show as well. And again, lots more of uh, Lucy. And of course, was involved in this fabulous book, an illustrated tribute to Lucille Ball, Loving Lucy, with the foreword by Gail Gordon. And of course, you know, Gail Gordon and Lucille Ball were fast friends. They were friends for decades. And uh she loved Gail Gordon. She loved Vivian Vance. Wonderful shot of uh, Lucio Ball and Gail Gordon there. Fabulous behind the scenes shot of the Lucy show. And you can see Vivian Vance there on the right. The Lucy show is a great series too. And so is Here's Lucy. And uh, this was really fantastic. Henry Lamar, fabulous artist, was a guest on our show. And he did this for Tom. Isn't that cool? Henry's a brilliant artist. If you didn't see the episode of the Jim Masters show, reminding you, we've done a th over a thousand twenty episodes of the Jim Masters show Entertainment Lifestyle Celebrity Talk Show series, which we can binge watch all on our YouTube channel. Henry was a guest on our show, and Henry did this beautiful artwork for Tom, which I thought was really, really sensational. Great shot here with Tom Watson and Lucy Arnaz in the center and Madeline Kuhn and Bob Carroll Jr., the two on the end. Of course, the writers, along with Jess Oppenheimer, um, creator, producer, I Love Lucy. Uh, if you didn't see the episode where Jess's son, Greg Oppenheimer, was on our show, yeah, we celebrated Greg. We celebrated Jess. Really incredible. That's a great episode. So check that out. Also check out the episodes where Lucy Arnaz was a guest on our show. We talked about her fabulous stage and Broadway and musical career, but also um, her involvement on Here's Lucy and uh, talking about her mom, Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz and Vivian Vance and William Frawley and, and all of the incredible folks. We also talked about Betty White and, on this episode as well, which I thought was really nice. And these are shots with Tom with Betty who was a friend, as I mentioned, uh, and he shared with us here on the show, this wonderful book, which I believe was back in 1983, Betty White's Pet Love, how to, how really pets take care of us, 
you know, you were expected to say how to take care of your pets right now, how they take care of us with their unconditional love. Betty White with Thomas J. Watson. We also showed you the book about Judy, Portrait of an American Legend with Thomas Watson and Bill Chapman. You can find all these, you know, dig for these as well on Amazon and all of the places where you can find books and more. Let's talk to Lucy, those tapes that Lucy Arnaz had and wasn't sure what to do with, and they brought them back to life, and I believe it was on Sirius XM as a special channel. Conversations with Lucy, kind of talk show-like with Eve Arden and all the celebrities of the day. He also uh, shared with us some of the other colorized versions of um, Lucy, which I thought was great and how the process, the painstaking process of colorizing was done. Yeah, we had the guy right here on the Jim Masters Show for all of you and hope you enjoyed this episode of the show. Again, if you did, like, comment, subscribe, uh, share it with everybody. Let them know that uh, we've got these extraordinary guests here on the Jim Masters Show live series. I want to let you know tomorrow, what another fantastic guest we have Muppet historian Craig Shemin here on the show. He is part of the Jim Henderson Legacy Foundation. He knows everything Muppets, everything about Jim Henson. He's worked with it all. And we celebrate the Muppets. We celebrate Jim Jensen. We celebrate Craig. We celebrate all of this tomorrow at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. That's going to be a lot of fun. Craig's all excited. We're all excited. That's going to be tomorrow here on the Jim Masters Show. Uh, John Tesh, legendary John Tesh, television and radio host, of course, former host of Entertainment Tonight with Mary Hart. Uh, of course, his radio series, Intelligence for Your Life, with, uh, of course, the John Tesh radio show, and, of course, the podcast with his lovely wife, actress Connie Selica. And... Uh, Give the son, and of course, his uh, daughter Prima is a health and wellness fitness expert. John was on our show last night, and uh, he is, of course, a phenomenal musician. He's going on tour, we're going to see him soon on his Christmas tour. He's coming to the East Coast as well. And he was so open and real about his life, including his not that long ago cancer battle. And it was really something very, very special. If you didn't see that episode, check it out. And the night before, Marriott Hartley was here. Yes, and her husband, Jerry Sroka, and Stuart Pankin, and Peter McNichol, fabulous actor, and Peter Onorati, talking about a new film, our almost true love story with Marriott and Jerry. And we had so much fun on that episode of the Jim Master Show series. And it was just epic to have all of those stars on the show at once. That was just a couple nights ago. You can see that episode as well. And so many more. If you like the episode, interact, let us know. We love hearing from you. Um, William Graff says, Loving Lucy is terrifically illustrated. It's a journey through Juice, uh, Lucy's career. A must-have. I agree. And thank you for being here, William. Spread the word about our show. Binge watch some of the other great episodes, and it's nice to have you with us and everybody joining us, all new viewers around the world. Thanks, Jim, for another great show. You're welcome. Jane watching in Sweden, interesting show. Thanks for uh, having Thomas being here tonight, and thank you, Jim. And uh, thanks again for all you do. You're the best. Good night, all. Cheers to you as well. Now, we say good night because when we're doing the show right now, it's about, uh, what, a little nine after nine East Coast time. But many of you watch these in the archives so it could be morning, noon, or night, whatever time it is. We're so glad to have you here watching and enjoying what we're doing here at the Gym Master Show. So, spread the word. Thanks for being with us. Come join us when we talk Muppets and television and all of it. Jim Henson and with Craig tomorrow. That's going to be really special. And we thank one more time our illustrious guest. It's really cool. Tom and I were excited about this. We put this together a couple of weeks back as we celebrated Lucio Ball and so much more with Thomas J. Watson, executive producer, director, author, and so much more. Really a cool episode, uh, as all of them are, and uh, you make it special by being with us. So come see us again. We'd love to have you here. 
Uh, stop by Lovety Hall, Jameis Lovety Hall, and see us on the Gym Masters Show Live. I am your host, Jim Masters. Thank you for your time this time till next time. Swear the word about our show. Love having you here, and I'll be right here waiting for you. Catch us on the next episode of the Gym Masters Show Live. Take care of one another. Be good to one another. And don't forget, as we always say, take care of yourself and be good to yourself. Love having you here, as I said, and uh, this was really a great episode. Be well and cheers. <laughs>